A former chief executive of Mexico State oil company Pemex accused of corruption has been arrested in Spain. A tense competition at the OAS as candidates for secretary general make their opening pitches. And the legacy of apartheid lingers on. A new report shows South Africa remains one of the most unequal societies in the world. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South. A former chief, chief executive of Mexico State oil company Pemex accused of corruption has been arrested in Spain. Emilio Lozaya is accused of accepting $10 million in bribes from Brazilian construction giant Odebrecht. He has been on the run since last May. Serving as Pemex chief from 2012 to 2018, Lozaya was also a top advisor to former President Enrique Peña Nieto and allegedly took bribes to help fund Nieto's presidential campaign bid. He denies all the accusations but his lawyer says that Lozaya has yet to decide whether to fight extradition from Spain or return voluntarily from Mexico. Moving on, the Organization of American State is preparing to choose its new Secretary General for the 2020-2025 period. The Permanent Council of the OAS met on Wednesday to receive the candidates Maria Fernanda Espinosa from Ecuador, Hugo de Sela from Peru, and the current Secretary General, Luis Almagro. They presented their proposals and initiatives for the organization. The election will be held on March 20th, when the OAS will also choose an Assistant Secretary General. The former president of the UN General Assembly and former foreign minister of Ecuador, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, presented her perspective for the OAS. If elected, she will be the first woman to lead the OAS. We are rich in diversity. We can also be wealthy in unity. We have a decision to make. Either we commit to moving forward to a new powerful stage in the history of the organization, or we simply maintain the status quo, continuing along the same path, contend with frustration and lack of meaningful response to the great challenges we face. The OAS is irreplaceable. However, institutions must, must change with the times. They must grow and evolve. We now must face the challenge of renewing, revitalizing, and rejuvenating the OAS. Espinosa also said she will promote a real integration in the region, including Caribbean nations. Her candidacy was put forward by Antiguan Barbuda in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The countries of the Caribbean have great potential for development and are a hemispheric example of regional economic integration. The particular challenges demand special attention from the OAS. I propose a Trans-Caribbean Blue Economy Initiative, a funding and transfer initiative for low-carbon technologies. I will put into full operation this time the contingency fund for natural disasters. I will use the convening capacity of OAS together with CARICOM to facilitate dialogue and agreements on financial services and other macroeconomic challenges. I will encourage the strengthening of interconnectivity efforts with and among the Caribbean. I will promote a student and cultural exchange initiative for the development of bilingualism among the American and Caribbean peoples. Breaking down the language barrier will guarantee real and lasting integration. Argentina has postponed payment on the $1.47 billion of its foreign debt, just as a mission from the International Monetary Fund is in Buenos Aires to begin talks on restructuring the country's debt. On Tuesday, protesters urged the government to prioritize food security and social services over paying off the massive $57 billion bailout loan agreed between the IMF and the previous government of Mauricio Macri. More demonstrations are planned this Wednesday by trade unions and social movements that support the government's attempts to renegotiate with the IMF. Let the money not go to the International Monetary Fund. Let it actually be a serious plan that will be able to help the poorest sectors. Last week, the Argentinian Senate approved unanimously President Alberto Fernandez's law to restructure the $100 billion, billion of foreign debt. 
and the president toured Europe to gather support. The government says the debt is unpayable and it is present in its present form and that their priority is to lift the country out of recession and tackle the legacy of poverty and inequality left by Macri's right-wing administration. Our correspondent Carolina Silvestre has more from Buenos Aires. This visit by the International Monetary Fund comes in the middle of many protests in Argentina. This Wednesday evening, human rights organizations and other social movements and trade unions are holding a demonstration against the IMF and to demand that it takes responsibility for the debt acquired under Mauricio Macri's government. You'll remember that President Macri agreed a $57 billion loan from the IMF, of which $44 billion have already been disbursed, and this is the amount that the new government of Alberto Fernández wants to renegotiate. The visit also comes as the economy minister, Martín Guzmán, appears before Congress to explain how this renegotiation will be conducted. The Argentinian Congress already gave the government the legislative tools it needs when it passed last week the law on sustainable foreign public debt. The government's debt strategy does not just have the support of the Congress. Also last week, President Fernandez was in Europe, where several leaders said they would support Argentina to give the country time to restart the economy before it has to pay off this debt. In other words, to allow the government to address first the domestic social debt left by four years of Macri's neoliberal policies. Pope Francis also offered to mediate with the IMF and he pointed out to the fund that countries cannot and should not pay their debts at the costs of the suffering of their peoples. So most economists here in Argentina believe President Fernandez will succeed in getting a good deal with the IMF that will allow the country to restore economic growth and reschedule the payments on its debt. Thank you, Carolina, for that report. Thousands of young people have been marching in Venezuela to celebrate Youth Day and the anniversary of a major battle for independence. Members of the youth branch of the ruling PESUF party, along with other students and social movements, joined the march to the presidential palace. Youth Day in Venezuela, celebrated on February 12th as a victory day to commemorate the Battle of Victoria, led by Félix Rivas in 1814. I call on the youth, you and your leaders, to keep up mobilization permanently, to keep up your work of education and developing awareness, because an aware critical youth is capable of making its way along all the paths that will face you in the future. The rest of the 21st century belongs to you. Our correspondent, Leonel Retamal, was with the marchers in Caracas. We are here in the middle of this youth demonstration to mark 206 years of youth rebellion. As you can see, there is a lot of energy here, with school students and other movements out in the center of Caracas, to commemorate the historic battle of victory in the struggle for independence, but also to celebrate Youth Day. They are here to deliver a message of unity and love for the country, and to oppose all attempts to destabilize the country. Many of these young people are involved in community work and other cultural and sports projects. The march is setting off from here to Miraflores Palace, where they'll be welcomed by President Nicolás Maduro. And of course, they'll be joined by a number of other social movements, which are also celebrating this day. And staying in Venezuela, the Venezuelan opposition lawmaker Juan Guaidó got a stormy reception when he returned to Caracas airport on Tuesday. As he came through the baggage hall, Guaidó was confronted by a worker from the state-owned airline Conviasa. She called him a traitor for promoting the U.S. sanctions against the airline. And as Guaidó exited the airport, the self-proclaim leader met more protests from angry workers. We'll be right, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. 
A new report by the International Monetary Fund says South Africa remains one of the most unequal societies in the world. According to the report, the top 20% of the population controls over 68% of national wealth, while the bottom 40% holds only a paltry 7%. The report also notes that despite the strides made by the African National Congress-led government to address the legacy of apartheid, black people continue to be the worst affected by poverty. 93% of the 13 million people living along the poverty line are black. Supporters of former South African and President Jacob Zuma have vowed to defend him from what they say is persecution by the government of Cyril Ramaphosa. The group calling itself Radical Economic Transformation Forces claims that there is an orchestrated plan to destroy the legacy of Zuma by a group of individuals opposed to the former president's attempts to increase the participation of black people in the country's economy. They have accused Ramaphosa of being an agent of white monopoly capital. The same power dynamics and powerful interest groups with as the common denominator white monopoly capital and the fronting agents yes, yes. are involved. Yes. Therefore, our clarion call for justice for President Zuma will always go hand in hand with our insistence that white privilege and preferential treatment and white economic domination and control of our economy must come to an end. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa and the South African Cabin Crew Association have filed an urgent court application to stop retrenchments at, at the South African Airways. Last week, the government appointed business rescue practitioners, which took over the management at the struggling airline. It last year announced that 11 routes would be cancelled as part of a way to save the cash-strapped airline from shutting down completely. Unions, however, say that this will result in the retrenchment of thousands of workers. The difficulty is that when you've got an ailing airline with challenges in terms of meeting some of the short-term targets, with huge pressure in terms of debt repayments, uh, tough decisions have to be made. The consequences of that is obviously that SAA will not need all of the staff uh, that they currently have because they have less routes and obviously less need for different staff in this environment. We expected a radical restructuring and uh, stopping loss making routes is one of the things that, that was an option on the table. We're not that necessarily fussed about the announcement of the routes that are being stopped. What we are quite angry about, however, is announcing uh, retrenchments without actually announcing your business rescue plan, which means um, we're in basically retrenching as a knee-jerk reaction to cash flow, and that's not the way you're going to save this airline. You're not going to retrench yourself into profit. Malawi's Electoral Commission Chief Jane Ansa has defended the institution's conduct in the running of the 2019 elections, which have since been annulled. Last week, Malawi's Constitutional Court declared the May election, which gave President Peter Mukarika a narrow win, null and void, citing irregularities. Appearing before a parliament committee, Ansa admitted that correction fluid was applied to result sheets, but dismissed accusations that it meant one candidate was favored than the others. He called the auditors to ask them why they had allowed, allowed this. They told us that um, everything was all right. The TPEX was used uh, to make corrections. Citizens are facing a national crisis in Sudan due to an acute shortage of bread, fuel, and foreign currency. Children were among the adults who waited in long queues to purchase bread and refill their tanks. This current scarcity has hampered the nation's economic revival 10 months after the ousting of Omar al-Bashir. Years of conflict in Darfur and other regions and the secession of South Sudan in 2011 left the country's economy in chaos. We are suffering a lot because of the lack of fuel. Since the early morning, we get up and stand in the queue for bread. Students have even left schools to stand in the queue to get bread, fuel, gas and transportation. What our country has witnessed, from shortages and the supplies and high prices, is just a scene that reflects the miserable economic situation that has been inherited from the era of destruction. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this.
Welcome back to From the South. Italy's Senate has stripped a far-right opposition leader, Matteo Salvini, of immunity, allowing prosecutors to put him on trial for illegally detaining migrants during the time he served as interior minister. Salvini had refused to allow 116 rescued migrants to disembark the Gregoretti Coast Guard boat where they had been languishing for about a week in difficult conditions. A deal was eventually reached with other European states to host them. Salvini faces up to 15 years in prison if found guilty. Everyone in Italy, whether they like me or not, knew and knows that by voting for the League, by voting for Salvini, we would have done everything to block the arrival of illegal immigrants. Moving on, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has won the New Hampshire Democratic Party a primary. Sanders, who led the polls going into the vote, got 26% of the ballots cast, beating his closest rival, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who amassed 24.4%. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar was a distant third with 19.7%. It was another bad night for former Vice uh, President Joe Biden, who sank to a disastrous fifth place, getting just over 8% of the votes. Now, our campaign is not just about beating Trump. It is about transforming this country. It is about having the courage to take on Wall Street, the insurance companies, the drug companies, the fossil fuel industry, the military industrial complex. Our correspondent in Washington, D.C., Jorge Gestoso, brings us the latest details of the New Hampshire Democratic Party primaries. Jorge. Thank you. Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, and Amy Klobuchar are now the front runners of the Democratic Party after the primaries yesterday in New Hampshire. And now the three of them are reassessing their campaign in order to continue the momentum. Definitely Sanders has been established as the front runner and the one who is really pushing for the progressive agenda while now is in dispute the moderates between Buttigieg and Klobuchar. A new element that is really to be followed very closely is the former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, that according to a poll of the Quinnipiac University, appears in third place, like a candidate that is possible to be the nominee of the party, even though he hasn't participated yet in the debates. But he's already spending over $270 million in advertising. He's the sixth richest man in the planet with a fortune estimated in $60 billion. And now he's already starting a trip in the South where he wants to establish himself also as a viable candidate. In the case of Bernie Sanders, he's the one with more resources, with more organizations, and he is the one that in many senses is creating at least fear among the democratic establishment because his agenda is being seen by them as too progressive that that could be the weakest candidate to face Donald Trump. In any case, all of the candidates you know, last night were saying the final goal is to beat Donald Trump regardless who will be the nominee of the Democratic Party. We get back to you now. We thank Jorge Gestoso for that report. The United States President Donald Trump has finally come clean about his so-called Middle East peace plan, confirming that it prioritizes Israel's political interest. Reading out the details of the plan at the White House, Trump made it clear that the deal was aimed at securing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, further stripping Palestinian ownership of the territory. Trump's proposal has triggered widespread protests since it was announced last month. Under this vision, Jerusalem will remain Israel's undivided, very important, undivided capital. 
The Diamond Princess cruise ship located off the coast of Japan is preparing for a second week in quarantine after an additional 39 people tested positive for the coronavirus called COVID-19. This takes the total number of confirmed cases to 174. The ship, which had over 3,700 passengers on board, has become the largest single cluster of the disease outside China. It will remain in quarantine until February 19th. Those who remain on the vessel have been asked to stay inside their cabins and wear face masks. Meanwhile, residents in Hanoi, Vietnam are, le are lining up to buy face masks as concerns grow over the coronavirus outbreak. The death toll in mainland China has risen to 1,115, 1 with one confirmed death in the Philippines and one in Hong Kong. More than 44,600 people have tested positive for the virus. Our correspondent Iramsi Peraza has an update on the spread of the virus. Iramsi. Las autoridades sanitarias de China Health authorities in China announced that more than a thousand people have been killed by the new coronavirus, now called COVID-19 by the World Health Organization. The head of the WHO said it was important to have a proper name in order to avoid stigmatization and xenophobia. Authorities have also said the figure of those infected is now more than 44,000. Efforts and plans to contain and prevent the outbreak are still ongoing, but it's not all bad news. Authorities say 4,000 patients have been discharged from several hospitals after overcoming pneumonia and other complications from the virus. Besides Wuhan in Hubei province, the epicenter of the virus, other nearby cities are seeing a decrease in cases. This confirms the effectiveness of the measures taken by China to contain the virus. During a forum on the virus, authorities said there is a real chance of overcoming the virus. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has extended its global emergency designation for the Ebola outbreak in DR Congo. The recent outbreak was first identified in August of 2018 and has since killed more than 2,300 people in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Though there has been a sharp decline in cases, who says for the epidemic to be declared over, uh, there have to be there has to be no new cases reported for 42 days, which is the double amount of time for incubation. UNICEF has warned that tens of thousands of children and civilians are suffering amid violence and chaos caused by Libya's long-standing civil war. Let's have a look. It's not necessary to have an in-depth knowledge on the impacts of war on civilians to see that one of the most vulnerable groups are children. Since 2014, an armed conflict rages between Marshal Khalifa Haftar, the head of the Libyan National Army, and the Ambak government of National Accord to fill the power vacuum left behind the killing of President Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. And as a result, tens of thousands of children are displaced. The situation for children in Libya is terrible. The conflict has displaced more than 90,000 children since last April, while more than 200,000 children have left their schools during the same time period. This comes as at least 200 schools have been closed across the country, and there seems to be no end in sight to fighting. In early February, the latest and mediated talks between military representatives of Libya's Tripoli-based government and Commander Khalifa Haftar have ended with no breakthrough. Protect their rights, give them health care, give them water and sanitation, and allow them to go back to school, because it all starts with education. Indiscriminate attacks in populated areas have caused hundreds of deaths, and UNICEF has received reports of children being maimed or killed, and many of them are also being recruited to the fighting. There are also 60,000 migrant and refugee children, many of them kept in detention centers. They are often exploited and horribly treated as they become victims of human traffickers. Since the fall of President Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, Libya has been in the throes of ongoing instability and economic collapse despite its large oil reserves. During the latest round of talks in Geneva over the first week of February, the two warring factions agreed on the need to expedite the return of internally displaced people, but they didn't reach an agreement on the best ways to achieve that goal. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. 
And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Until next time.